Yes, now that, it's inc I mean, there's so many reasons for how this is unbelievably unprecedented. With us now, I can't even begin. Republican Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania. Hello. Pat actually is here this Hi, morning Pat. to defend the idea of letting <laughs> Vladimir yes. Putin run our Russian cybersecurity unit. Defend what the, the what? idea that it's a good idea for the fox to guard the hen house. Right? Yes, yes, what? yes. So I take you agree with John McCain um, and everybody else. Lindsey Graham is a Lindsay terrible idea. Put it well. Yeah. What, what? What? It might be the dumbest idea. What about what about uh, when Lindsey Graham said uh, on Meet the Press that when the president uh, says let's just forgive and forget on on the cyber theft that he's actually weakening the presidency? Do you agree with that also? I, I do. I think. Look, the meeting with Putin, I think, was a big disappointment. After a great speech in Warsaw, which we were mm -hmm. hoping for, waiting for, we got it. And that meeting with Putin was. Was a problem. What is your biggest? Levels. What is your biggest concern about it? I think the biggest concern is Vladimir Putin needed to come away with that meeting, from that meeting, understanding that he's going to have to pay a price for his aggression in Crimea, for his aggression in Ukraine, right. for his aggression in the American elections, and that there's a president who let him know squarely, you're going to pay a price. And here are some of the features. By the way, there's a tough sanctions bill that just passed the Senate. I'm looking forward to signing it. Um, it's still time for us to provide defensive resources for the people in Ukraine. We're going to do that. And until your behavior changes, these things don't get reversed. Mm -hmm. That, that should have been, been the message. That yeah. would have been good, Harold. It, it's uh, uh, Pat. To your point, um, it, it was just fascinating. None of that happened. Are your other colleagues? I mean, we've obviously seen the reaction of McCain and and and, and uh, Lindsey. But are other colleagues of yours, Republican colleagues of yours, expressing more and more? Obviously, Ben Sass. But is this a more commonly held? Uh, feeling about not just Russia but other issues. Yeah, honestly, um, we'll find out more tonight. We're back after being out for the Fourth of July week. We'll be discussing this among ourselves then. But look, I think the vote in the Senate on the Russian sanctions bills tells you something. It, you it was know, ninety-seven to two. Yeah, <laughs> and two two what two that two. does, right, yeah. is it significantly shifts power and authority from the White House, from the presidency, to the Congress. It takes away the president's unilateral ability to lift sanctions, for instance. Oh, I don't know the last time we did that, um, but it's in this bill. It's the reason it's contentious. In the but, house. but a point I'm trying to get at: Does this impact health care and taxes? So How much of that, that? That's what I was really trying okay, to get sorry. at. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't finish it there. I think the answer is no. It doesn't. Uh, look, it does we, not. we got enough problems with health care. That's a big challenge for us, obviously. Um, but I think what's going on in in this other space um, does not directly affect that. Right. Senator, is it appropriate for a presidential campaign to solicit or accept negative information about a rival from a Russian national? No, that doesn't strike me as appropriate. <laughs> well, what's, what's going on? <laughs> I, on a limb? I was going to say what, that is a leading what's, question. What's, what's, what's wrong with it? Yeah. But I'm saying, what's wrong with it? Um, look, I think it uh, it encourages uh, countries to come in and undermine our democratic process. And these, a lot of these countries have great capabilities uh, to do that sort of thing. Uh, I don't think we want to have that happening. So, what does it say about Paul Manafort and Donald Trump Jr. and well, let's Jerry see, Kushner right? we that have they sat in a meeting? The purpose of which the intent was. So let's let's find out about this is this is sort of breaking news. I think this came out over the weekend. Uh, there were how many people in this meeting? I think we're going to find out what happened in this meeting. We're well, going to learn a lot more about it, and we should. Ninety-seven to two. That was the vote on, in the Senate. I think so. Yep. Okay. So while you're proceeding on that bill, which basically strips a piece of presidential power from the president of the United States, what kind of pushback, if any, do you get from the White House, or did you get from the White House? I've gotten zero on this, and I have a great deal of interaction with the White House. They lobby you before? The no, bill? no, okay. not at all. Um, but it, full disclosure, no big surprise, I spend most of my work on domestic issues, economic and fiscal and tax and health care, and have very extensive interactions with the White House in those areas, but I didn't hear a word from anyone about the sanctions. One more question about this, and then we'll uh, go to David Ignatius and get to health care. But uh, what message would you have for your uh, Republican friends in the House who right now are being lobbied by Donald Trump to weaken or to strip out key provisions of your sanctions bill that you passed 97 to 2? I would say, um, first of all, follow your instincts here. I think my Russian, uh, my Russian, my Republican colleagues in the House understand full well that Vladimir Putin is no ally. He is no friend. He is an adversary. That is a permanent situation with respect to Putin. And 
we have uh, the, the consensus in Congress better reflects where the American people are on this, and this is the right thing to do. David, David. Ignatius. Senator, uh, your state, uh, Pennsylvania, was one of the crucial states in getting Donald Trump elected through the Electoral College. And I'm curious what you're hearing from your constituents. We talk on this show, we talk in Washington about these issues, but it's always a bit of a puzzle how much this conversation is penetrating the voters uh, out in the country. What, do you, what are you hearing from voters when, when you talk to them about Russian meddling in the election, about, about, about Trump's contacts, those of his associates uh, with the Russians? Are people getting worried about this? Uh, somewhat, but I'll tell you, I did a uh, town hall meeting last week, and the issue that came up time after time was health care. I mean, that's the front burner issue. I think there's um, some concern in the background about other things, including Russia, certainly. Uh, but health care has been the dominant issue. So, so, so to that extent, the conversation that we're having still hasn't really percolated in the country as a whole. I, I would say not to the same extent as healthcare has. And again, you know, this most recent meeting, we learned a lot about it just over the weekend. It's it's quite new. All right, so let's let's turn to health care. Sure. What are you hearing from your constituents? Well, uh, so as a general rule, and I think Joe will uh, back me up on this. You tend to hear from people who are angry with you. And how right? are they the people feeling? who agree what with you and think you're about? doing a good job yeah. usually don't call you, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. Of course, okay. with Harold, everybody loved him. So well, he'd just walk out. It was a challenge. Flowers right? thrown because, at his feet you know, and hugging. Never any criticism. Town hall In all seriousness, yeah. though. So, yeah, look, yeah. Um, I think there's been a lot that's been grossly mischaracterized about this bill. People have heard that. People have legitimate fear based on what they've heard. I think much of it is inaccurate. But we're hearing a very vocal protests from people who don't like the direction we're heading in. What's inaccurate? Well, I would say the characterizations of Medicaid are wildly inaccurate. So the Republican governors are wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're wrong. Look, the Republican governors like having a lot of free money thrown at them. That's a fun position to be in if you're a Well, governor. it's not like they can, you know, uh, build Ferris wheels along the interstates with that money. It's not free no, money. It's, can, it's to take well, care no, of the, the poorest the among us. Medicaid expansion component, right? The Obamacare decision mm -hmm. that adult, able-bodied, uh, working-age people with no dependents would qualify for Medicaid for the first time. Obamacare promised 90% of that to be covered. So that's been attractive for a number of governors. Our suggestion is, our legislation, is that over the course of seven years, we will gradually transition to the point where states are paying their conventional share. Less than half, federal government will still pick up the lion's share of this, but the states will eventually get to the point where they're paying the same portion for this category of Medicaid eligibility as for all the other categories. Do you disagree with the CBO's assessment that 24 million Americans it's, will lose health care insurance? I, I, I think it is wildly speculative, Joe. If you dig down, as the Galen Institute and others have done into the CBO score, how do they come up with these numbers? For instance, one of them, several million, they assume that if people are no longer required to by the individual mandate, they'll decide to abandon free Medicaid. So you have free health care for your family under Medicaid, but if you're not forced by law to participate, I'm out of here. I think that's implausible at the very least. So if you can't but, speculate but, on the CBO's numbers, can, can you tell us what the numbers are? Are you concerned? Look, I look at the substance of this. What are we doing here? What are we doing? What we're doing is we keep the entire program intact. We keep the new eligibility category intact. We ask the states to pay their share. But we do one other thing that I think is maybe as important as all the rest. In the eighth year, mm -hmm. We actually require that the program begin to grow at a slightly slower pace so that we have a chance of actually keeping up with this. Joe, you know I've always been concerned about the growth of our entitlement programs. Right. They are driving the fiscal train wreck we're on. Medicaid is the single biggest driver of this. Medicaid, I'm sorry, Medicaid is the single biggest driver of this. And what, tell, someone needs to tell me, what is a more responsible reform for a giant out of control entitlement program than a slight curb in the rate at which it grows at a point in the distant future? Why aren't we doing that with Medicare, which is just as big of a challenge? Why is it this, that we're going after the poor? You've got to start somewhere. This is the so biggest why, one. Why are we this starting the, with the poor? This is the biggest of the problems, Joe. It is the one that's growing most rapidly. This is contributing 70% of our budget deficit deficit right now. It's, it's, it's the one that's in our lap because of Obamacare. I think we do need to make reforms to Medicare. I've been arguing we also need to make reforms to Social Security. You know that. I've been making this argument since I, 1998. I, 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 I know you have, and you're one of the few that 
you've been as consistent as, as, as a few others of us talking about entitlement reform. I'm just concerned that the one entitlement reform we start with is for the poor. Let me ask what these cuts do to your rural hospitals. What happens if you're in Williamsport, Pennsylvania? What happens if you're in western Pennsylvania? Uh, these are cuts in the rate of growth. The rural hospitals are going to be able to manage this. And by the way, some of the some of the really important things. Ha, have they said that to you? That they're fine? Or are they, some, are, some, are they some, complaining? Some more so and some less so. Um, the reality is um, there are whole new ways that some of our health care providers are discovering tremendous opportunities for savings. It's, you know, the Geisingers of the world, UPMC. Um, the insurance, Independence Blue, the Lehigh Valley Health Network, using big data in ways to identify people who are likely to develop expensive and problematic health concerns, finding ways to intervene early. There's tremendous innovation that can happen if we allow it to happen, but we also need to put this on a sustainable path, and that's what this legislation attempts to do. All right, Pat Toomey, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.